or should I say Dzień Dobry? That's about the only Polish I know. Uh, okay, so today I'm going to talk about uh, big data and how we've scaled our infrastructure for that at Spotify. So a small little survey. So how many in here are working with big data in some form? Oh, there's a few, yeah, a few people. Okay, so for you other guys, this is going to be a bit of a learning curve, maybe. Let's see. Um, so let's kick it off. Um, if I can get this to work. Hold on. There we go. So this is me. I've been in this industry for quite some time now. Um, and yeah, I like Emacs. I love Java as well. Uh, but more significantly, since 2013, I've been working at Spotify as a backend engineer mainly in our data infrastructure. Um, Spotify, I guess most people here know what it is, but you know, music streaming company, one of the biggest ones out there. Uh, we've been doing this for more than, oh, actually 10 years almost now as a public product. The company has been there for 10 years at least. So small agenda for the day. So I split this into three parts. So I'm going to go through how we do data at Spotify. So basically what we as a data infrastructure provide and so forth. Uh, look at some of the sort of re reasons or root causes of what happened. So, uh, and then I'm going to talk about the summer of 2015 and what happened then. And then from that, I'm going to talk about some of the challenge we identified and how we basically solve these by implementing a few systems. Uh, so data, big data. Uh, to talk about big data, you have to talk about the big elephant in the room. So for you guys who know big data, it's kind of obvious. It's a product called Hadoop from the Apache project. So this is the main product to actually run and do big data processing uh, in a concept called MapReduce. So this is a crucial component in any big data company. You typically install this. It's a free open source product and you scale the hell out of it. And uh, if you're lucky, like us, this you know, becomes a fairly big thing. So I'm going to go through the history of Hadoop for us. So we started 10 years ago with Hadoop. We started with five servers. Uh, we converted some, actually, we, I think we double installed, never mind, five Debian machines uh, in our office. Uh, we put Hadoop on them because we, have, we, we want to do some, some reporting. Um, now, the downside of that was, of course, that they were in the office, and when you start running heavy computation on these, all the fans go off and people get kind of annoyed because of, because of the noise. Um, I mean, that, that's how we started. Then, then we, we created our first data center, and you can see in the picture there on the right, that's John, who's super happy. He's in the data center, which is also the foosball room, um, and you can see the servers there on the floor basically just stacked on top of each other. Now, this was in 2008, basically a year after we started with Hadoop, and we had trouble. Uh, when we did heavier computations, one of the data nodes would crash every time. And we just, first we couldn't figure out what was going on until John figured it out, and that's why he's so super happy over there. Because in this room, the data center, uh, well, let's say this, we didn't have any air conditioning and there's a window there and this was summer so the sun fell on the top server there and it would overheat and you know luckily hardware actually f sort of shuts down when it overheats so it doesn't actually burn up but so john is super happy here because he found a solution he he bought some curtains so we could actually yeah so that that's sort of <laughs> The early beginnings, we did everything ourselves. Um, I think also these servers were actually like uh, scavenged. Like we took them from s other projects and shit to just get things going. Um, now after this, it sort of started to take off and we started doing more and more processing. And in uh, 2010, we were at sort of a scale where we realized that we were, you know, the, you know, scaling and adding these servers and configuring and managing them becomes quite hard. So we started to look at Elastic MapReduce already back then. And it was a really nice offering, you know, let AWS take care of that, scale the shit for us. Uh, at, but at that point, it was just a bit too expensive for us. We were still a fairly small company. Uh, it made sense sort of a, like a product, but it was just too expensive. Actually, that's where we realized it was better for us at the 
pl time to actually just to co-locate. So we started a co-location in London uh, where we already had co-location for the rest of the services. So um, yeah, we started building up our data, proper data center, real data center uh, with proper cooling and everything. I think we, when we have that sort of thing up, we had some 60 servers running, uh, hosts. Uh, this, of course, grew and grew as we started doing more big data. And in 2012, we realized that this Hadoop component has become a really crucial part of not just big data, but for the company as whole. I mean, we were doing some you know, business critical stuff on this. So we, we realized that we, we have to have some expertise here. You know, if, if something fails with Hadoop, we have to make sure that we can fix it. So we started using Hortonworks HDP. It's basically just the open source product, but with support. Because uh, otherwise we were relying on the community. You know, it works quite nicely, but typically if you need a patch with the like just the open source community, things can take weeks before things get fixed. And we didn't really have the expertise. So that also we realized maybe we should invest in expertise as well. So actually in 2012, we, we hired actually two Polish guys uh, to run our Hadoop cluster. And, and I mean, this is a, if you know this guy, Adam Kawa, he's a really good, I'm plugging, he has his own company in Poland today uh, and does Hadoop uh, su uh, support and, and development. Uh, but yeah, and it, it really paid off because we really got control over this and we felt quite assured that things would work. So very interesting sort of breaking point when you realize that this business is critical, you actually have to put some money down and not just rely on sort of open source and, and, and free stuff. Now, of course, this has just continued to grow and today we're running um, a fairly big cluster. I'm not sure, but it might be one of the biggest in Europe. So we're, we're over 2,000 nodes. I think it's something like 50,000 cores or something like that uh, in, in our data center in London. But uh, now we have a different problem. We're out of space. We, we can't put any more physical machines in there. And Hadoop needs to be sort of co-located, I mean, close. You can't spread it over geography because of latency problems. Because otherwise your data might be over there and you're processing here and then just, yeah, it fails. Um, so this is why we have moved to the cloud or we're moving to the cloud. So last year we announced together with Google that we are going to move not just our data infrastructure, we'll be moving everything all of our backend service into Google Cloud. Now, why the cloud or more specifically, why Google? There's just one answer. It's all about focus. I mean, we are a music streaming company. We don't want to build data centers because that would be our obvious next step. You know, start building like Google did or Facebook did, but we don't really want to take that path. We want to focus on being the best music service out there and our idea here is that with Google, because, for, you know, face it, they invented this big data scene. So the whole Hadoop is actually based on a white paper that Google wrote back in 12 years, I think, about MapReduce. Um, and we believe that Google is going to continue innovate in, in this big data area. We were already seeing some of their key products, such as BigQuery, uh, that basically transformed already our, uh, yeah for our analysts. I mean, basically going from high, which is typically the way you do it in, in traditional Hadoop to, to BigQuery, you go from, you know, let's say 30 minute processing time to three minutes. That's a big difference when you're trying to explore big data. Um, yeah. So when you're working big data, you have to have some numbers, right? So, so here's the numbers that are interesting from a big data perspective when it comes to uh, Spotify. We have over 100 million active users uh, per month. We have a catalog of over 30 million songs. Uh, but more interesting, we have over 2 billion playlists. I mean, people save a lot of weird stuff. Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you should, yeah. Uh, and, we, uh, and what is also interesting is that we are active in 60 different markets. Every market has its own. And actually, that's, that's the biggest challenge with that is probably not technology is actually legal because you need uh, um, deals with the record labels, basically locally in every country. So that's, uh, fortunately, I'm in technology, so I don't have to deal with that. Um, now, this, this big growth of users have created also big growth in our data. So today, we are 
ingesting more than 50 terabytes of data from our users every day. There's another 50 terabytes coming in. But what's more interesting on the other side there, you can see that our developers and analysts actually create more. It's north of 60 terabytes data. I think it's actually even more today when running some 10,000 MapReduce jobs every day. And that actually is increasing faster than the, the users because we're adding more and more developers. So this is an interesting challenge for, uh, for us who are providing the infrastructure for this to work. Um, and, and if we take a look at how we're using data, so if we go back to 2007, when we had those five servers, there was just one use case. We need to do reporting. Sounds boring, right? But this is, you know, for business, kind of important. You know, we need to calculate how much each song has been played so we can pay the right labels, the right amount of money, because, you know, most of the money that we take in actually goes to the labels. Um, now, fast forward 10 years, we're still doing a reporting. I mean, this is the main, you know, use business case that we have. But basically, any feature that you use in our application today is using big data one one form or the other. We have pure data products such as Discover Weekly, if you're familiar with that. It auto-generates a nice uh, playlist for you every week. And, uh, but most features are using something like A-B testing to test that we're actually developing the product in the right way. We try not to be sort of subjective. We try to look at the numbers when we develop stuff. So yeah, big data is at the heart of the whole product today. So. Let's look at how we work sort of more detailed. Um, so all of our teams, we have this concept of autonomy for our teams. And what it means is that we give freedom to our developers to, on how they build their product. So you can do whatever you want within boundaries, of course, but we, we, the main focus for us is time to market. We're still a startup, even though we're quite big today. We haven't won any game yet. The main, you know, important for us is to get our products out there fast enough so we can iterate, so we can feel, you know, the, f the, f the sooner you fail, the sooner you're going to succeed. That's, you know, that's the mantra for every startup. So, so for us in data infrastructure, we, en we want to enable... Uh, this process. So in, in this case, we have team A who's, who's creating some MapReduce job. They, they want to use a couple of data sets to create an, yet another set. So our focus is to great, create the best tools to make this as fast as possible. With autonomy, our, our teams can select whether to use our tools or not. That's really up to them. But the main focus here is speed. Um, now, when you do something like this, of course, uh, you don't do, you can do this once off, of course, but that's, that's not interesting. The interesting part is when you start producing a data set, typically you have some kind of cadence. You do it daily, hourly, weekly, something like that, because that's typically the pattern you need to do some kind of longer term analysis. Uh, now, over time, what happens is, of course, other teams are going to be interested in your data and you're going to start creating dependencies. Now, because we've, in the data infrastructure, we focused on speed here. We kind of forgot stuff. I mean, you know, three teams, five data sets, that's pretty easy to keep track, right? Even with, you know, hundreds of, of data sets, it's still kind of manageable. But if we take a look at, this is actually a dependency graph. It's, it's our, this is just a part of it because I, I wanted to show something that was well, it's not even, this is not even readable. You know, it, every ellipse here is a data set. Every hour is a dependency. Let's start zooming out. And this is the full picture. Uh, kind of hard to read, right? Uh, we're looking at 4,000 unique data sets. There's over 13,000 dependencies here. So, you know, it becomes pretty blurry. But, you know, there is a path all the way from the left to the right. Now... We focused on making sure this happened as fast as possible. What we forgot was about maintainability and operations. I mean, how do you monitor this? How do you make sure, and, and specifically ownership? But I'm going to come back to that. So, so this complexity which we have here and that huge growth that we had, that, that creates a uh, interesting mix. And this is when we move into the summer of 2015. Um, 
So let's take a look at what we had in 2015. We had, so this is only part of our data infrastructure and really you're not supposed to sort of understand it. Just the point here is it was complex. So there's basically just two parts I'm actually showing here. One is our event delivery system, which is basically from the middle on to the left, all those yellow arrow, arrows there. And we had a Kafka-based delivery system back then with, uh, because it was based on an early version of Kafka 0.7. It doesn't have reliability, but we were doing business critical stuff on this. We needed reliability. So we created a layer on top of this with feedback and yeah, pretty complex stuff and completely manually controlled. So we had to go in and tune and, and you know, just to try and keep up with the ever increasing scope. We had a capacity model, but I'm coming back to that. On, on your right see at hand side, you can see under the sort of Hadoop uh, blob there, um, we had these edge nodes. So the way, and these were the, the, the nodes that actually spawn and run the data jobs. So each team that wanted to run a data job had owned sort of one of these edge nodes and basically through Crone would schedule this. So fairly basic setup and it worked perfectly fine, you know, for a few hundred jobs. But now we're looking at 4,000 individual jobs. There's a, at least a few hundred of these machines scattered all through our infrastructure. Um, yeah, and that created what we now call the summer of incidents. So <laughs> what happened, we had a strain of incidents relating to, to big data, typically around Hadoop. Um, and uh, they didn't seem to be sort of connected in any way. They were just piling up one after the other, and sometimes several. Um, and this was summer, and you might be aware that uh, in Sweden, we typically have like five weeks of vacation and people tend to take it. So it, it was kind of hard to find <laughs> engineers to, to do this, but, but uh, yeah, we, we, we huddled up some people into a, a big conference room basically and just started working on this. Um, and and uh, yeah, we, we fixed it, but it was really hard work. And, and you know, we had definitely problems uh, uh, with Hadoop because you know this gets very centralized and, and when that central central component ha is struggling it affects everything so some of the stuff that happened for instance was we needed so Hadoop has this you know a lot of nodes that where you're processing and storing data and then you have these sort of central key points which are called the name nodes they're like the ones that track everything like the trackers in, in, in so to speak there is an H you know failover thing in there but at really large scale it has problems and in some instances we needed to reboot or basically restart that whole thing now the problem that occurred was when you restarted and this these are big machines with lots of ram because they need to keep track of a lot of things and typically they want to keep everything in memory but at boot time you know they start up and then you have this shit storm of of data jobs trying to be scheduled because we have hundreds of these edge nodes trying to schedule thousands of jobs and they do it by Crone. And for you who know Crone, Crone is basically just, you know, this hour, this minute, this second, I want to schedule something. And typically people would copy these Crone files, so everything was scheduled at the same second. <laughs> Not so smart, huh? Uh, and of course, the name node had problems just starting. They would stall and they will, you know, belly up. And, and, and the way we actually solved this was figuring out, okay, let's get all the IPs for these edge nodes and just firewall off them. So basically denying everybody a service because basically what we've created was this distributed you know, denial of service, a DDoS attack on ourselves. <laughs> you know, not the best moment, but yeah, but, but at least through firewall we could get that. I mean, you know, but you know, it's not an interesting place to be. And, and uh, of course, this created some, some interesting sort of situation where we stalled the whole system for hours at end sometime. And, and um, yeah, that was not so nice on our event delivery system. So this was trying to push data into Hadoop and Hadoop was down. Uh, you create this, I mean, that's not a problem. I mean, Kafka caches this, so, but then you have a catch up situation. And normally in a catch up situation, it's, you know, we threefold maybe the, 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 the load. But now it became very close to where we could not really catch up. <laughs> uh, 
And this is where we started realizing that our capacity model that we had for Kafka was probably not right anymore. You know, you, we created it at, at a certain model where a certain scale and it worked fine and we kept going back to it and scaling and adding machines and whatnot. And here it just, actually during one of the incidents, we, we actually manually started moving st stuff. Actually creating bash scripts and yeah, it was ugly, but we got it done. Um, so yeah, and, and frankly, the, the, the way we solved it in the end was just throwing a lot of hardware at the problem. You know, we realized that if we're going to sit there and try to calculate and figure out what the actual sort of key point in this architecture is that's going to drive the capacity, you know, we would just fail. So we just threw a lot of hardware at the problem. And that basically solved it. Uh, some of the other things that happened was because of these stalls and some of the issues and actually errors in our data pipelines, we, from time to time, needed to do all these reprocessing. Like, you saw that real long dependency graph. And typically, because we had no monitoring on this, we've, we would figure out it really further down the chain. Like, somebody was waiting for a report. And typically, it would, it would be produced within, let's say, eight hours. But it didn't turn up. So you wait another two hours. That was 10 hours late. And then you start calling somebody. And then we realize, oh, shit, it's one of the initial things that is broken. And there is, you know, seven of, or eight hours of processing that you have to wait once you start that. And then, of course, that has a huge fan out. So it goes everywhere. So it was really cumbersome. And, as, and, and from an operational point of view, the challenge was really that this was now defined in a cron file on an edge node somewhere. You have to find the right the edge node. You have to find the right cron line and then copy paste that and to remember to run it in a TDMAX section so you wouldn't crash the program if you lost your connection. Really important. Uh, another thing was when we had these data jobs crashing, it was really hard to debug them because, well, Hadoop has a really nice sort of debugging feature. You can see what's going on all the data nodes or the, the processing nodes. but. Uh, but that's just, you know, once you've scheduled it. And in, in many cases, or actually most of these cases, uh, we could only find the problem by looking at the log for the schedule, the actual job, the, the small Java program that actually starts the whole thing. And you need to get to that log. And that was on these edge nodes. So again, find the right edge node, find the curl line, try to figure out how it was identified. Then we've designed this, uh, so that all the log files for all the Chrome things were going to the same log, which meant that now, you know, you could have hundreds of jobs being scheduled on, on a single node. You now have to find the right log lines for your job. That was pretty painful. And, you know, ha this happened several times. And, yeah, it was not nice. Uh, but, hey, we, we fixed all these problems. Eventually, we got Hadoop in a much better place. We also got our event delivery in a better place but we were over-provisioning quite heavily. Um, but this got us thinking, uh, you know, what, what could we have done wrong, differently? So what we realized was basically three things. So we needed some kind of early warning system. So for these dependency chains, huge dependency chains, we needed to be able to visualize, but most importantly, be able to be alerted and so forth for this. That's why we built a tool we call Datable. Uh, the second thing was debuggability and control. As you heard, it was tedious and really hard to get to the right logs, but also to control this. I mean, we, we didn't have an easy way to control our, our scheduling of our, uh, of our jobs. Um, and that's why we built Sticks. And lastly, uh, our event delivery system just got us thinking and we realized with this ever-increasing load, you know, we're going to be constantly coming back to this. And now we were at a state where the capacity model, we didn't really trust it anymore because it basically had failed us. So we thought, rethought this and we realized that the only way to truly scale is to automate. Make sure that we as humans are not part of this, of, of, of making sure that something scales. It should auto-scale. And that's how we built uh, Gobble, our new event delivery system. Now I'm going to go through all these three and uh, sort of look at the sort of overview of what we did. Um, so let's start with, with Dynamo and how we dealt with uh, early warning. 
So let's go back. We have this nice dependency graph, right? Um, now, when, when we were looking at it, we realized if you, if you tilt it on its head, it kind of resembles an iceberg, right? And it really, how we felt, like we're on the top of this and that's what we can see, but the problem is typically really low, deep in really dark, dark, you know, dark water. And you ha really have to hold your breath for a long, long time to figure out the problem. So what we realized that we had to do was we had some way to get a unified view of big data. So we, we talk about the same things and we see the same things. Some teams back then actually had created some kind of monitoring, but it was a bespoke, their own thing. And other teams typically didn't know about it. And, and typically because you have dependency chains, it's interesting, you're interested in whatever is sort of upstream from you. Uh, the second part sort of I already talked about ownership. We've sort of dropped the ball on this. We had no clear way of, of of ownership uh, back then actually the way we figured out who owns something you know you have an operation situation something has broken we know that this is this thing some flow you go into git and you do a git blame to figure out who actually wrote that code just to realize that that guy or girl has left the company <laughs> now who you ask um, yeah so we needed a clear way and an easy, fast way to get to the owners of data and make sure that every data set is actually owned by somebody. Because that's the problem when you leave it in Git. Git doesn't change when you change your organization. So, and the last part was SLA. We needed a way to express SLA so, and, and to be alerted when we break them. So have this res responsibility actually mean something. Uh, so these were the three things that we really needed to sort of deal with. And now we knew, and, and that's why we started off with defining a terminology. And this is a big, big thing uh, as a company or an organization grows to make sure that you define, and this is just a snippet of three, three different things that we've defined. But basically defining, so you, when you speak about things, you actually talk about the same things. So we have the definition of what we call a data endpoint and partitions and events and so forth. Um, and, and the way we actually moved this to the organization was not to force people. It was just that we in data infrastructure actually started using these terms in all of our products, not just data mod. We were actually starting to communicate like this in, in our emails and so on, so forth. Um, the second part was that we needed a way to easily express this ownership and this SLA that we wanted. And so we used YAML files. And the good thing for us here is that already at Spotify, if you're doing microservices, we are already doing this. So we have a system we call System Z that, that basically scavenges Git for these YAML files and creates a model. So we can easily just through a REST API query this. So we just did some additional data here. So like the ownership, was already there, but it was typically for services. So we just forced or we you know, told people to do this or for data endpoints, data sets as well. So here we can see, or maybe it's kind of hard to see, but basically what you're expressing here is what is, you, what is it that you need to monitor? In this case, it's an HDFS partition. So uh, empathed HDFS, it could be GCS in Google Cloud or it could be something else. But it, that's, you know, just what, what are you expecting to be created at the end? And then you have an SLA at the end that says, we, 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 we cannot live with this, with, with this being missing. Uh, and after, in this case, 120 hours, it will actually alert. So this way, you know, we, we can actually express this. Um, and we also have integrations like PagerDuty. So when you break your SLA, it goes to PagerDuty, you get a page in your phone, fix your problem. Um, and lastly, of course, we've built a tool on top of this. So the actual datamon. And datamon, this is part of what datamon looks like. So basically every little box here represents a partition. In this case, it's an hourly partition. Like every box means that one hour of data has been produced. And the bigger box that are grayed out there, they're just, you know, bigger partitions daily. Um, and here we can see one data set that is turned red. Basically we've broken the SLA. The page has gone off, we're trying to fix it. And then you see a lot of blue boxes. So the blue boxes, Tell, uh, tells me that there's data missing. So basically the, the job is trying to start, but basically cannot start because it's dependency basically is missing. And re really what this tells me that this is a recursive 
data set. It needs the previous hour to actually be produced. And we have quite a lot of these. Uh, and actually, this is kind of a bad situation because it's gone maybe, what, 10 hours and we still haven't fixed the problem. But yeah. But th the best part here is that it's easily visualized and we can tune this for ev every squad. So you pick the data sets that you want to monitor, but we can also look at, look for, look at it from a global view. Um, and this has been super good for people who do data. And, and we, you know, this is crucial now for anybody who da does data at Spotify as a tool. Now let's move on to debugability and control where we implemented six. And at the heart of this was that we needed something better than Chrome, right? And there are actually tools out there, but none of them really fit our sort of idea of how we wanted to do this. So eventually we realized, and because we just needed that sort of crone part, it was a fairly simple problem to solve. So we realized that we didn't want to bring in yet another stack of something. And this is typically a problem, I would say, with, with operational tools for big data, that you, you want to pick, cherry pick something from another product, or like an open source product, but it's hard because it's tied into some kind of ecosystem, and you're not part of that ecosystem. So yeah, with Styx, we realized that we needed execution control. I mean, we needed a way to, to make it easier to spawn and respawn these data jobs not go into an edge node and find out the crow line to actually stop, do something. Execution information, we want to know what, this is the debuggability part, we need to know what's going on with this data job, not just in the data nodes. So we, we needed an easy way to see what was going on with the execution of a, a scheduled job, because be, before we didn't have anything, we just had potentially an alert. Uh, and the last one was execution isolation, I didn't really mention this, but uh, because we were heavy Debian shop, we were running Ubuntu. Our distribution mechanism for software out to the edge nodes is typically to Debian packaging. And that's a bit of, you know, if you have several different jobs on the same machine, depending on Debian packages, and now somebody wants to try a new version of a Debian package, he will update it for everybody. And, you know, backwards compatibility is not always the best thing, especially if you do something in Python. Um, so, so we needed a way to, to isolate the execution. So we, we started with the execution control and, and yeah, I mean, basically what, what, what Stux is is a fairly small, simple, um, uh, web service. It has a REST API, so it's easy to build something like this, an off button for, uh, for a data set. We can easily just turn it off if we want to. Uh, but what's more interesting is now we have, uh, I mean, we have a command line tool, uh, where it's easy, and now this is gonna, it's gonna be hard for you to see because basically it's on the bottom, but basically what it shows is, is a unified way of scheduling something. So we have the tool, we have command what you wanna do. You have one, one single way of identifying that data set. So you have a component and its ID, and then the, the partition that you wanna do something. The cool thing about this is that for me in operational situation, I could now reschedule any data set. I don't need to know the variations of parameters here. I, I, we, we adhere to the same idea of partition and how we express them. Uh, because in the past, it would look, I mean, again, it's not important that you see it, but you know, in the past, it was usually a huge command line with lots of parameters. And again, you had to make sure that you, you ran this correctly and in a TMUX session. So, you know, because if you do it in a normal shell and, and your network breaks, you actually stop and crash the program. Uh, so with Styx, this is just a REST API. So you just asynchronously fire away something. Um, but the more important or interesting fact here is the execution information. So now Styx is just a REST API. So it's easy for us to create a GUI for this. Uh, and I realize again, it's quite low for you guys in the back, but basically what we see here from top to bottom is the executions of different uh, partitions. So in this case, different hours to create this data set. And, you, and then on the sort of X axis, uh, you see the different tries. And here I've expanded one because first of all, it was missing a dependency, then it failed when it ran once, and then it has succeeded. So I'm quite curious on why it failed the second time. And now what I can do is I can click on the link and I get all the logs for that submitted job. And what we've done here is that we've utilized Google Cloud logging 
because we're moving into the cloud and the way we are executing this, it's just an easy enablement for us. And basically what we do, we just add a tag into the cloud logging when we skip, and, and that becomes part of the search expression when you, you kick this off. The nice part for us is that, you know, we need, don't need to develop something here, but you could easily do this with something like Kafka and Elasticsearch. There's actually another talk about that. How do you do your logging? And you could do something similar. Uh, but yeah, I mean, for us, the real benefit here is it's a managed product. We don't have to kill, deal with the details. Nice. We can focus on the core of what we try to do here. But for me, in operational situation, the important part is I get to, the, to my log lines. The last part, execution isolation. And hey, and there's no surprise here. We're using Docker instead. So we moved away from Debian packaging. Actually, you can still do it, but within a Docker container. <laughs> um, so the API for Styx is just an execution of Docker container, slightly different than normal because what we are expecting it, it is for it to end. So it's just a way to wrap an execution. And what we're expecting the container to do is to, to give us a return code. So zero classically, if everything is good, but we also have 20, which means dependencies are missing. And that's why we can show those blue boxes or, you know, uh, things. So, and yeah, and here we're utilizing Kubernetes. So instead of having these edge node managed by ourselves, uh, we're using you know, instance groups with Kubernetes where we can auto scale. So now the scaling of these sort of edge nodes where we actually start this is automatic. And that's quite nice. Um, yeah, and, and, and this has changed the way we look at and, and process immensely because it's so much easier to keep track of things and to reprocess stuff because now we can basically script it very easily. Uh, now let's move on to the last thing. And then this is sort of my pet peeve because I used to be part of this team uh, that actually did event delivery. So we realized that our capacity model just didn't work anymore and we wanted a way to get ourselves out of this. So basically automate our capacity. And, and if we look at the, the system we had back then with this complex Kafka system, uh, where we had this reliability layer on top, um, we just realized that, you know, we have to get all that manual control out of that. You know, we, we were manually spawning up new machines, new Kafka brokers to, to deal with the ever increasing load and doing quite a lot of network tuning to make, because this is, you know, we were transferring some 500,000 messages per second in peak. And then if you're, you know, if you're in a catch up, that's like three times that. And, and that's, that's a lot of data to keep track of. So at the time, we were actually planning to do a new version of this based on Kafka 0 0.8, where you actually have reliability. It would have created a more simpler solution, but it would still be inherently the same thing. It's a manually scaled solution where we have to have a capacity model to see where's the breaking point when we actually have to add new machines. Um, now, in 2015, we had already started talking to Google about our move to their infrastructure. So we, we started talking to some of their teams and there were two products for us that really stood out. One was PubSub, kind of obvious. It's pretty much the same thing as Kafka, but managed product. And the other one, one is Dataflow Streaming. And this is uh, Google's Apache Beam offering, but managed. And managed means that, you know, we don't have to deal with scale. They will. We just deploy and it should be automatic. Uh, so Dataflow was a pure one-to-one -one mapping to Kafka. It has the same delivery semantics, at least once delivery. But that also means, because it is at least once delivery, means that at the other end, when we're moving this into Hadoop or anything else, we're going to have duplicates. And from a business critical point of view, we need to deduplicate this. That means that at the end, we need to do some kind of processing to clean up the data. And, and uh, traditionally, this is a MapReduce job uh, and, and some kind of consumers that you need to auto scale. So, but with data stream, uh, data flow streaming, we realized we could just create a fairly small Java program to do this. And basically to have this happening in sort of real time. Um, and yeah, it looked really cool. So we said, let, let's try this. Come on. Um, now, before, you know, do you guys trust what your solution providers tell you about their products? Neither do we. 
even if it's Google, you know. You know, you, it, it, it is a sales pitch. You have to realize, even if you're talking straight with some engineer, it's still, you know, they're pitching their product to you. And, and so we, we really, before we sort of went all in on this, we wanted to make sure that these point products actually could deliver on the promise that we wanted. Because one of the things here was, because we were so, seeing this really big increase in our scale, was that we wanted to be able to handle whatever load we had today, but also what we do in the future. So we said, anything that we pick needs to be able to cope with at least 10x what we're doing. That means 5 million messages per second. Um, now, we started with, with PubSub, uh, doing some point tests. And basically, yeah, it worked out of the box. I mean, well, not out of the box, but um, it, it really can handle our scale and 10 times that. So we were super happy with data streaming. So then we moved on to Dataflow. Uh, sorry, we were with PubSub. Dataflow streaming, uh, as I said, we, uh, when we did like the first MVP of this, it was about 2,000 lines of Java code, so fairly compact uh, code. And uh, we started test this, and yeah, functionally it worked. But as we started adding more capacity, it started to fail on us. We were starting hitting some quarter sort of cases. And the main thing was that even though we have, we, we have a lot of load, it varies quite heavily over the, 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 the day. So, and it typically be became a problem for the high-end ones where that variation becomes too large and, and especially in the op ramp, uh, because what data flow streaming needs to do is, is to recalculate the sharding on how to deal with this immense amount of data because when you do the deduplication, you have to create uniqueness and when you do that, there is to use a window and that window needs to fit into a memory of a VM because that's how Dataflow works. That means that your sharding, basically how you chop up the data is very important, but that's also based on heuristics. And at this time, in, in, in back in 2015, early 2016, it was not mature enough to, to handle that in a good way. It would crash. And we worked with Google for some time to try and fix this. And I don't know what the state is today, but, but basically we realized that you know, our use case with this large volume and lots of volatility in our data was not just a, a good fit for data flow streaming. So we kind of had to revert back to a more traditional approach. So now we have two traditional web, service, uh, sorry, web services, microservices, and a data job to do, to do the thing. Now we're sort of back, even though you know, it's much simpler architecture than, than the old Kafka thing, we still have these consumers that need to scale, and we manually have to you know, add these as we add our scale. Uh, and that's when we realized that in, in, uh, in the Google's offering, when it comes to instance groups, like basically when you create a cluster of any number of VMs, you can set them to auto scale on CPU. So basically you set a minimum number of machines to a maximum number of machines, and then set a target CPU level. Now CPU is not the best metric here, um, as we found out pretty fast because um, we, we tried to do this with very small VMs to have a granular control. Uh, so we had only two cores, but we're also running Puppet. And when Puppet runs, it steals 100% of your CPU for about a few minutes. Now then the Google auto scaling kicks in because it realizes, oh shit, this machine is on its knee. I need another one. And then it provisions another one, which starts Puppet. And then, you know, all of a sudden we were maxing out everywhere. Um, so it, there is <laughs> some tuning to this before you actually put it in production. Uh, but all in all, the CPU-based um, scaling actually f worked fairly well once we sort of got the rough edges out of it. And Google is actually right now, they're, they're implementing uh, another set of APIs where actually you can use other metrics, which makes a lot more sense. You can connect uh, this to the RPS, for instance, of that topic which you're consuming, which makes a lot more sense when you're scaling. So, um, the cool thing here is that now we've basically got this to auto scale. We don't have to monitor this, not at least at that gradual level that we did before. Um, there was, however, one thing that we realized at, when we got to this point was that we had more and more 
teams actually wanting to use this. So we were still kind of the bottleneck here. So as, as somebody, if somebody wanted to experiment with our event delivery or add new, new events to be delivered, they still had to come to us. And we th had to do quite, you know, it's, it's not that complex, but there's few steps. You have to set up a, a new consumer, you have to create a topic, you have to create a subscription and all that to, to make this happen. So we realized that we could also automate this. In a similar fashion to the other tools that I've talked about, we used YAML. So it's very simple YAML definition. You just say, I want to produce this event. And that will trigger off a tool we call the stuffer, which again, pulls Git for these changes and just redeploys a new cluster. And, and what this does, it enables our squads to do even more experimentation, which is really where we want to be. Um, and uh, yeah, so what we've come to now to is, is an infrastructure for our data that is it's much more simple. Uh, you know, it's not simple, simple, but it's easier, at least from operational point of view. And I think that's sort of my sort of main focus here is that we've moved a lot of the products that we've built ourselves into managed products. And now our challenge is different. I mean, instead of technically knowing details about Kafka, now I have a relationship with the PubSub team. Now that's a whole different topic on how you deal with your, your solution providers. But for us, it, it's a much better operational situation. Um, and and uh, I'm gonna finish off here by summarizing. Basically, there's two things I want you to take away from this. And the first thing is in big data, operational tools are really hard to find. It's really hard to find something that will be a good fit for your operational needs. In the big data scene, there's a lot of focus on development, on development tools to make it easier to create map reduce jobs. There's a lot of abstractions you put on top. We, for instance, we've had, we have a project called Shio where you can do Scala development on top of map reduce, actually on top of data flow if you like. Uh, and that, that, that's great for productivity and get time to market. But once you're there, once you have it in place, you know, it's really important to get those operational tools in place. And uh, so my point here is if you're at the sort of point where things are starting to grow, take a breath and look at your data infrastructure and what your actual operational needs are, because this is not going to be a fast thing. Like Datamon from start to finish took more than six months might sound short but in in a startup world you know that that that's actually quite a long time uh, and the last part dealing with scale yeah the only real solution to dealing with scale is automation so try to remove yourself from from your capacity model as much as possible uh it's not always easy but you can do it now that's all i had thank you Now we have some time, so any questions?